four languages and on five continents. Um, some of these topics include indigenous peoples on the US-Mexico border, Asians in the Americas, um, with special attention to the Chinese diaspora in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as has diversity, multiculturalism, um, race, race relations, and minority politics in the United States. Well, yeah, Sylvia, <laughs> you know, just these days I say to people, just Google me if you want to know more <laughs> because there's all these things going on. Anyway, uh, that just goes to show how long I have been working. I was telling my old friend Fernando, my old friend Professor Eshiro Azumatu, and we've known each other. Mm -hmm. 20, 30 years, who's counting, right? <laughs> and thank you, Professor Barch and Professor Pillai and Rupa and all of your students. I was so thrilled that it's the Latin American and Latinx students who invited me today. And, and I understand Asian American students are also invited Asian American studies. So I'm really pleased to share with you some of my work. I have so much to cover and I created this big old PowerPoint because I'm going to go through the PowerPoint so you can capture the images no? and some words. So I start with this observation that Latin America, can you hear me in the back? Okay, actually, that can Latin America and the Caribbean. Yes. Right. Can I just say something? Before yes. You start? Can we uh, get a round of applause just so I go? Woo! Oh, okay. For you like what I say. If you don't like it, you don't have to. I start with this observation that Latin, Latin America and the Caribbean, like the rest of the Americas, is a region of enormous racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity. Joining the millions of Native peoples came others from everywhere else in the world, Spaniards, who were themselves diverse, representing not just Christians, but Jews and Muslims, fleeing inquisition and religious persecution at home, they and other Europeans who came along for the ride of empire building enslaved millions of people from Africa who brought their own languages, cultures, food crops, and food habits. And of course, Asians were part of the mix. How and when did they come to America? Some of you may be surprised when I tell you shortly. Let me make another observation. From inception, Latin America was a race conscious society in that miscegenation or race mixing at the personal intimate level happened as soon as these, ra these races converged with each other. This did not mean that whiteness and white supremacy was displaced from the top of the social hierarchy nor that Latin America was not defined by its own version of settler colonialism. But mixed race categories such as mestizo and mulato emerged very early, along with as many as 16 other mixed race classifications called castas. The naming of these many mixed race combinations means that Latin Americans always recognized and accepted the fact and the reality of race mixing. There are also a collection of paintings of castas, like this one. Is it advancing? Yes, it is. I'm just bad at it. I, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm getting it. So I can see it. Do you see the uh, casta painting? Okay, first of all, uh, yeah, this is an example of a casta painting. And then many, many like us are interested in how race mixing was depicted. Just go Google casta paintings and you'll see a, a, a whole portfolio of these paintings. I'm gonna explore you, with you briefly some key mixed race identities involving Asians, notably the widespread Afro-Asian Latino, Latinas, Latinx. So let's begin the discussion today with a quick overview of the history of Asian diaspora, or more accurately, diasporas, plural, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Recent scholarship, recent scholarship, yes, to the Spanish empire in the Pacific is compelling us to backdate the arrival of the first Asians to the Americas, specifically today's Mexico 
to a much earlier than the conventional historiography has presented. The new beginning date is now towards the latter half of the 16th century, when Miguel de Legazpi sailed from Acapulco, Mexico, to in New Spain or Mexico, across the Pacific, to Cebu Island in 1564 and colonized the archipelago for Spain named Las Filipinas after Emperor Felipe II. Then they built the Spanish capital, colonial capital of Manila on the big island of Luzon. This became an entrepot for trade with China. Why? Because the Chinese desired the silver that these um, Spaniards from Mexico brought with them on this first ship that crossed the Pacific. China was changing its currency system to one based on silver. What did the Spaniards, the Mexicanos, and other Europeans wanted from China? Well, the most beautiful things in the world, because China had the most advanced economy in the entire world at this time, and especially uh, skilled at manufacturing so many beautiful things. But the main items of trade that the Europeans wanted was silk of all different kinds, porcelana or ceramics, ivory, marfil, and spices, of course, and lacquer and all these beautiful things, which we don't have time to go into today, but uh, you can probably find out if you, again, go online now. There's uh, more information on this. But it was called the Manila Galleon trade, and it lasted from 1565 to 1821, 250 years, with one huge galleon ship sailing back and forth, bringing silver to China through Manila and bringing all these beautiful goods from China to Latin America. And today, if you go to any museum in Latin America, if you go to any church in Latin America, you will find these products made by highly skilled Chinese artisans uh, from China and then from Manila. Anyway, I just want to set the record straight that the first Asians who came to America and to Latin America, to Mexico specifically, was in the 16th century, not 19th century as we all, most of us have learned. And how many of these Asians came? This is really incredible. Let's go on to the next uh, slides, okay? This is, this is how the, the, the galleon ship sailed across the huge Pacific, you know? And if you look at this map of, of Spain and the Spanish empire, catch this word, Spanish empire. How many of you have ever linked the Original migration of Asians to America to the Spanish Empire. That's the book I'm writing now. No? Chinese under the Spanish Empire. That's the title of my new book. It hasn't been written yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I got a title. <laughs> but you can see that this really was truly an empire and it's the first modern globalization. No? Africans from the South Atlantic and slave peoples went to the Americas. And then of course, Asians came across the Pacific also to the Americas. How many? We don't know exactly how many, but the estimates run from about 20,000 to as many as 100,000. And there are all kinds. Let me show you who are some of the early migrants. Aha, this is, this is for Rupa. For Rupa because this is a South Asian woman from the Mogul Empire, who was set, came to Mexico as an enslaved woman. Oh. And she became immortalized. So one of you asked in the question uh, that you asked me, that uh, Kathy sent me, was that what, what were the Chinese or Asians in Latin America, Asians in Latin America, uh, did they become part of the national myth of Latin America? Well, indeed they did, because this South Asian woman, her name was Mira or Catarina de San Juan originally became known throughout Mexico as La China Poblana, the Chinese girl from Puebla, La China Poblana, who is another early Asian immigrant, a Japanese, no, a Japanese lord, his name is Luis the Enchil. He was an immigrant and businessman of 
who established residence in Guadalajara, married a local woman, his fellow Japanese, Juan de Payas, no, became his son-in-law, married the daughter, and Luis de Encio, lest you doubt me, let me show you a contract that he signed with his name in Japanese. And this is a contract for making what? Well, we're in Guadalajara, remember? Making tequila. Okay. <laughs> Still, if you want good tequila, you go to Guadalajara. And Luis Encio, 1634, signed this contract to make tequila with a local Mexican businessman. So these are the early, early Chinese uh, 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 Asians who came across the Pacific and ended up in America, okay, in Mexico. Meanwhile, back in Manila itself, very quickly, 20 to 30,000 Chinese came to Manila from Southern China, from the province of Fujian, and built the first large overseas Chinese community. And I am maintaining that this Chinese community in Manila launched this historical phenomenon called the Chinese diaspora or the Asian diaspora, but let's say specifically the Chinese diaspora. It started under the Spanish empire in the Spanish colony of Manila, 20 to 30,000. And this is a nice drawing of that early Chinatown in Manila called the Padian. No? Here is uh, the Padian in Mexico City. They named the big market for all these products coming from China. They also called it the Padian. And today, you go to Guadalajara, you go to the Mercado Municipal, the local market, you see the Padian word again. No? So the word Padian has become uh, uh, synonymous with market. Now, these galleons, okay, so I'm going to go on because I know my time is already running short. The next big wave of Asian immigration did occur in the um, 19th century. Okay. Let me, let me skip to this one. And now I want to introduce to you another empire. This time we're talking about the Japanese empire and migration of Japanese to the Americas. The UN at the same time that the Japanese empire was sending people to the Americas, first to Hawaii and then to California, and Professor Echiro Azuma uh, is the expert on this. So go read his book if you want to find out more. Okay? But this Japanese empire and the US empire converged. They occurred around the same time because the US was also advancing from the East Coast to the West and to the Mexican border. And um, I want to very, very quickly that uh, this Japanese uh, uh, empire sending its people to the Americas, no, is the next great diaspora. Um, and not only to uh, California and Hawaii, but uh, to the rest of the Americas, no, particularly to eventually Brazil, to Peru, uh, and to other parts of the Americas, but those two are the main countries. And you already saw that very early Japanese immigrant to Guadalajara, no? So by the time the 19th century, the mid to the late 19th century uh, comes around, I, we can identify three great Asian diasporas. No, the Japanese, the South Asian, and the Chinese. And each one of them was uh, 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 involved with uh, European empires. Each one of these migrations was motivated and engineered and brought about by European empires. The South Asian Empire to the Caribbean came over as labor migrants to I won't say replace, but to succeed African slaves after slavery was abolished. No. Up to 2 million, they think, to places like Guyana and all what we today call the British West Indies. Uh, but the um, period also saw a massive 
migration to uh, to Cuba. I, I'm going to come to that in just a while, but I just want to say something about the Japanese in Latin America. Uh, because the Japanese in Latin America, uh, and particularly in places like Brazil and Peru, have really become an integral part of their um, of these societies. Not that they have not faced hostility or some aspect that we might call racism, but they have become so deeply, you know, uh, integrated into local society. And I just want to introduce you to a few of these. Uh, Japanese Latin Americans. No, we don't have time to go into too much, but these are some of my favorites. One is Ryohi Inoue, who's a Japanese Brazilian writer and Brazil's most popular author. He's written over 1,000 books and still counting. He writes about a book a week and he writes, <laughs> he writes about all kinds of topics. He's trained as a throat surgeon but he's become a writer about love, war, cops, spy, science fiction, ghosts, and he ghost writes for famous Brazilians. And the Guinness Book of World Records calls him the world's most prolific writer. He doesn't write about Japan, he doesn't write about <coughs> Asia, but he is an Inoue, Ryoki, from uh, of, of, of Japanese heritage. I also want to introduce you, so those of you who are literary, uh, students of literature, of Latin American literature, you should look up the work of Pedro Shimoze, which has been, um, his work has been included in many poetry anthologies, and he's a Japanese Bolivian poet. There's also, I didn't have a, his picture, Jose Watanabe, W-A-T-A-N-A-B-E, N-A-B-E, Watanabe, he's a very celebrated poet, Japanese descent of Peru. Okay, so I use these literary figures because that's one way of showing how deeply integrated an, uh, 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 an immigrant, a person of immigrant heritage is in the local society. And of course, the most famous Japanese Latin American has got to be Alberto Fujimori. No, Alberto Fujimori, a two-term president of Peru. No, very controversial person, but um, he is now in jail. However, that's not the end of the <laughs> Now, that's a long story about Fujimori. Among other things, she captured the head of the Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path, but he's been convicted of corruption. However, that's not the end of the Fujimori story. By the way, in Spanish, in Peru, his name is pronounced the Spanish way, with, uh, which is Fujimori. In Japanese, it will be Fujimori. Anyway, his daughter, Keiko Fujimori, is a leading politician who almost won the last election and is now the head of the opposition party. So the Fujimoris are still around, okay? One more thing I wanna show you that has, that's connected to the, to the Japanese empire and migration are these Koreans that we found in Cuba. Well, Koreans, why are they connected to the Japanese empire? Because Korea was part of the Japanese empire. And out of that Japanese empire, some of the immigrants were Koreans, no? just like this Korean community still living today in Cuba. Now let's go then to the biggest diaspora of all in Latin America, which is the Chinese diaspora. And I begin the story of the vast Chinese diaspora with Cuba. Cuba in the late night, in the mid to late 19th century, brought over, you could say imported, a large number of Chinese contract laborers, colloquially called coolies, which is actually a South Asian word for a low-skilled abject worker, a coolie. So the so-called coolie trade, or in Spanish, la trata amarilla, the yellow trade, consisted of 125 contract laborers, indentured laborers, under eight-year contracts. And they came to Cuba, which was still a Spanish colony. So this is the end of my book. My book begins with Manila in the 16th century and ends with Cuba in the 19th century. At the end of the Spanish empire, but one of the last gas activity, action of the Spanish empire was to bring over Chinese laborers. Why? Because slavery was being abolished slowly. Cuba had a very slow process of abolition of slavery, and they were experiencing a huge shortage of laborers. 
So they brought over cute Chinese from South China, in this case, from Canton. Okay. At the same time that the Cubans, that the Spanish in Cuba were bringing over contract laborers, this is why I say the end of the 19th century coincided with the rise of the U.S. American Empire. Because the U.S. American Empire, by the middle of the 19th century, had already taken over half of Mexico's national territory, the famous or infamous Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and also had taken over the, te the uh, uh, Texas from Mexico. No? So what we are seeing by 1849, which coincided with the gold rush in California, California had passed from Mexico to the United States. Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, this vast territory switched political hands from Mexico to the United States. No? So you can see, look at this map. This is a wonderful map because it shows how this 19th century migration used the same shipping routes as the earlier Manila trade by crossing the Atlantic, no? So most of those labor migrants from Canton, China, this time it's a province, province south of Fujian province, the province that sent its people to Manila. Now we go farther south to Canton province. And they cross the Pacific uh, to Canada, to the United States, California in the West, and also to Peru and South America. However, look at this sex, uh, uh, alternative routing. Cubans had to bring in the Chinese because Cuba is in the Atlantic. No, it's in the Caribbean, in the Atlantic. So this is the route. This is a route crossing the Indian Ocean, rounding the, the, the uh, Africa, the African continent, and then entering the Atlantic in, into, uh, into Cuba. They all came from a tiny little piece of Canton province that we call the Pearl River Delta. Can you, can you follow my, yeah, <laughs> the Pearl River Delta. You see this area here, Macau on one side, Hong Kong on the other side, you see? And this is a Pearl River Delta. So almost all the Chinese who went to Cuba and later on went to California, same time, same place. They all came from the same place, no? They were recruited. But they did come under contract. They came ostensibly as free immigrants. And again, timing is everything in history. The gold rush began in 1849, just after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So some Cantonese people went to California, others ended up in Cuba, no? all as labor migrants. Now, I just want to very quickly show you the contracts that these Chinese laborers had. Uh, when they went to Cuba. And this is an extraordinary document because it's a bilingual document. Spanish, here's a Spanish version. And guess what? They had a Chinese version too. It's a Chinese version. Uh, I don't, again, have time to go into this, but I've written quite extensively about it. So if you're interested, you just let me know and I'll send you my work. But I just want to show you very quickly though how important Chinese labor was because you can see that the the, the influx no, of Chinese workers very neatly correlates to the end of the official slave trade from Africa. And at the same time, the production of sugar continued to rise. So for this brief period from 1847 to 1874, 125,000 Chinese, almost all men, 99% all men, keep this in mind because I'll come back and mention this. Almost all men came to work on the eight-year contract. And it's a beautiful story. It's an elaborate story. Don't have time to go into this, but I want to show you that they worked you know, loading up the cane to the refinery, the Ingenio. Here's another shot of the Chinese laborers on a sugar plantation. This one I really love. It's a sketch of a Chinese uh, coolie, no? Uh, lighting fire to the plantation, to the cave, because this was a rebel. This was a rebel. No, this is a form of protest. And you can see that he holds a Chinese knife, no, the, the cleaver in one hand, 
and of, of flame uh, on the other hand. And here is also very interesting. One of you asked questions that Kathy um, sent me, that Professor Barch sent me about, well, you know, what kind of relationship, no? What kind of resistance that they have? Well, this is a fantastic example of Chinese coolies on the Cuban plantations joining forces with slaves and others fighting for Cuban independence from Spain. And when you, when you fought for independence from Spain, you're giving the honorific title of being a mangbi or a freedom fighter. And this is a Chinese freedom fighter. So again, if you study the Chinese in Cuba, you come up with different narratives and different stories that you don't know about because we think all Chinese are, uh, 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 how do I say, a uh, uh, passive, that they don't uh, uh, resist, that they don't rebel, that they don't right, struggle. And here's an excellent example of Chinese freedom fighters in Cuba. I have here just sharing with you the same thing, what's going on in California. Of course, they came for the gold rush, and then they came to build the Transatlantic Railroad. This is so important because we forgot who was a US president who authorized the construction of the transatlantic railroad that connected east to west. The same one who fought the civil war to keep north and south together. We talk a lot about President Lincoln, but we forget to mention that he not only kept north and south together, he also unified the country from east to west by building this incredible transatlantic railroad using Chinese labor for most of the most difficult part of this railroad, which is from west to east because the Chinese workers had to blast through the Sierra, the mountains of the Sierra, using the Chinese knowledge of, uh, of um, yeah. What, what, uh, oh, sorry, dynamite. Yeah, they, they knew about fireworks, they knew about, uh, uh, also a lot of carpentry work involved, a lot of skilled labor building the tracks. All of this, of course, ended for the Chinese in the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The Chinese Exclusion Act did not bar all Chinese, it specifically targeted laborers. So when you think about the Chinese Exclusion Act, it specifically targeted Chinese laborers. No? And, and it was led by the Irish of California because they were competing with the Chinese for, for jobs and other uh, uh, opportunities. Well, where did the Chinese go, right? They still came, except now they went to the U.S.-Mexican border. So I'm transitioning back to Latin America now. And this is a period of massive Chinese migration to the U.S.-Mexican border, the northern border with the United States. At first, look at this at first with the intention of surreptitiously crossing the border, crawling across the desert. And I say this is the original illegal immigrant crossing the US-Mexican border, no? But then because of massive American investment in Mexico in the border regions and mines and building railroads, the Chinese discovered they didn't have to cross the border into the US. There were plenty of opportunities that opened up to them, not to be laborers, but to be small mer uh, retail merchants as the northern border region industrialized. You know? As campesinos or villages or peasants became proletarianized, joining the wage labor force in the mining towns and the railroad towns. But of course, the Chinese couldn't cross the border. Many of them still had businesses or connections of both sides. And I just want to share this wonderful photo of the Chinese crossing the U.S.-Mexican border dressed as Mexicans. So this is a photo we found. It's a Chinese masquerading as Mexicans. Why? Because during this time, at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, there was no prohibition against Mexicans crossing the border. They could come and go at will, very different from today. But at the same time, I want to point this out. Remember earlier I said like Latin America is a race conscious society. Remember most of these immigrants, whether it was to Cuba or to Mexico, were men. 
and they quickly formed families with local women. So here I have a wonderful photo, a portrait of a Mexican woman and a Chinese and her Chinese husband with their mixed race children. And somebody else asked me in the questions I was sent, what was the relationship with the Chinese and the indigenous peoples? Well, here I found a photograph of a Chinese woman and her Native American neighbor and friend, Cordonia Garcia. Okay. This photo was actually taken on the Arizona side of the US border. Okay. I want to share with you before I go on, some of the descendants of these early Mexican migrants. Again, I'm going to use cultural figures to show you, on the one hand, how deeply integrated the descendants of these Chinese immigrants are to Mexican society. How many of you are Mexicanos? You are. Yeah. Do you know about Ana Gabriel? Have you yes. heard of Ana Gabriel? Have you heard of Ana Gabriel? Yeah, here's Ana Gabriel. Ana Gabriel is Mexico's most popular popular singers of Norteña music. No, Google her, you can hear beautiful songs. And she has a Chinese grandfather. That's Ana Gabriel. No. And just most recently, the highest ranking cabinet officer, secretary in the Mexican government, the previous presidency, not the current one, is um, Miguel Angel Osorio Chong. Chinese mother in this case, so, uh, highest ministerial position in the Mexican government. And finally, for good measure, I'm a big football fan. For all of you football fans, there was in the New York Jets team, Juan Wong. So I did some research of Juan Wong. I said, oh, he's a Wong, he's Chinese, but he's a Juan, he's Mexicano. And indeed, he is a son of a Mexican Chinese in Torreon, Mexico. And I was recently in this town of Torreon, which is in the state of Coahuila across from Mexico, uh, because I was invited by the current Mexican president who was issuing an apology to the Chinese community for all the, in Spanish they say agravios, for all the atrocities committed against the Chinese in Mexico. And I ran into this gentleman whose name is Juan Wong. I said, what's your son doing? He said, well, he used to play football. I pulled up this photo. I said, I have a photo of your son. It was just amazing. <laughs> you think that I'm somewhere in the middle of Mexico and I made this connection. <laughs> and for you Peruvians out there, there are some Peruvians, I don't want to leave the impression that all the Chinese were laborers or workers because a few of them did come with capital and invested and built enormous businesses. And this is an Aurelio Pao Sanchi family uh, in Peru with this beautiful home. This is his hacienda, his factory. You can see a, a very modern industrialist, okay? And finally, I want to introduce you again to your literary people, Xiu Gong Wan. Siu Gong Wan is a Peruvian Chinese writer of short stories. And you have to look up his work. He writes in Spanish, of course, and he writes about being Chinese in Peru. And I mentioned him because he won the highest literary award of Peru in one, one uh, in the, I think 1876, quite a few years ago, but he's a great short story player. Okay, so that's, that's the Chinese in Mexico and in Peru and elsewhere, just very quick introduction. But I want to close with one more empire. I've introduced you to the Spanish empire and its connection to Chinese migration to America. I've introduced you to the Japanese empire and its connection to Japanese migration to the Americas. I introduced you to the, to the uh, and, and then of course the British, the American empire, very important, you know, the American empire. And I'm going to introduce you to one last empire, the Chinese empire. Today's Chinese empire under President Xi Jinping and this initiative he calls the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is a form of soft empire, if you will. No, he didn't come into Latin America with guns a-blazing. No, he didn't take Mex 
had land in Latin America, colonized them and made them part of China, but they are coming in with massive investment in particularly in infrastructure, in commercial agriculture, like soybeans in, in Brazil, mining in Peru. Now, I show you the map. This is a map of the Xi Jinping's Belt and Road, which extends from China through Central Asia, all the way to Africa, a little bit in Europe, not much in the United States, but a lot and increasingly more in Latin America. You see Latin America, no? the Belt and Road Initiative, a lot of it in Brazil. And in the wake of this massive Chinese state-sponsored investment, this is mostly state-sponsored investment, we have seen a new wave of Chinese immigrants. We call them Xin Yimin or new immigrants. And I just want to show you two slides. Uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. If you go to Sao Paulo, Brazil, you will see streets upon streets of these new Chinese shopkeepers, oh, like these street scenes, both out in the open and in these buildings, oh, uh, with uh, uh, malls, mall-like buildings, full of Chinese shops, selling all kinds of things, so clothing to toys to uh, uh, everyday consumer items. That's in Sao Paulo, Brazil. This is in Tepito, which is in Mexico City. Oh, same thing, same thing, okay? So finally, I know we're running close to time, but I just wanna very quickly go through one more thing if you'll permit me. I wanna talk about this race mixture that is so unique to the Latin American Caribbean is the Afro-Chinese Latino or Latinx, no? So very quickly, look at here. This is Jose Ong. You meet Jose if you come to Cuba with me. Fernando, come and meet, uh, come with me back to Cuba to meet Jose Ong, who's a Lukumi priest. Lukumi is, is a Santero or a, a saint of the Santeria religion, the African derived religion, no? And I want to introduce you to the poet Regino Pedroso, who's of Chinese descent. And I want to introduce you to a, a writer called Antonio Chufal Lafour. What do they all have in common? They're Afro-Chino Cubanos. They're Chino Cubanos who are also of mixed African heritage. I want to introduce you to Alicia Castro, who with her six sisters formed the famous all-girl Cuban brand, band called Anacaona, which played with Celia Cruz and all the great Cuban singers and performers in their day. This is pre-World War II, okay? I want to introduce you to the painter Maria Magdalena Campos Ponce, who also has a, a Chinese grandparent. And the, in her paintings, you see, she invokes her Chinese heritage. You can see this. Can you see this in this painting, for example? In this painting, for example? No, Maria Magdalena Ponce. But most of all, I want to introduce you to the greatest Cuban painter, most renowned, Wilfredo Lam. Wilfredo Lam had a Chinese father called Lam Yang or Enrique Lam, and an Afro-Chinese, Afro-Cuban mother called Ana Serafina Castillo. So Wilfredo Lam, but look at Wilfredo Lam. He never used his mother's Spanish name. He didn't use the segundo apellido, which many Latin Americans use. He kept his father's Chinese name always, Lam. His only with greater Lam, no? And his sisters, but his greatest influence on him spiritually and later on as reflected in his art is his uh, maternal uh, godmother called Mantonica Wilson. Mantonica Wilson was a Santera or Lukumi of the Santeria religion who, when he was growing up, in this town called Sagua La Grande, no, in this town, in Sagua La Grande, she taught him when he was very young about the Santeria religion, which is the basis of what we call Afro-Cubanidad, no, Afro-Cubanus. Here we have him in, here are some of his famous paintings, which you can see the New York Metropolitan. Next time you guys go to New York City, go to the Metropolitan, ask to look at Wilfredo Lam's paintings, which I have there. Beautiful paintings, no? Okay, so with Fred uh, uh, uh says, I know my father is Chinese. I respect and love my father, although his father was very elderly when he was born. 
but with Vader Lam is most known for his paintings as expressions of Afro-Cubanidad. Later on, Wilfredo Lam went further than just Afro-Cubanidad. He studied with M.A. Césaire. M.A. Césaire is a post-colonial French Caribbean intellectual. In France, when he was with Picasso and other great artists of the times, he studied with André Breton, another uh, uh, African intellectual. And Wilfredo Lam learned about negritude, negritude which is a broader conception of Africanness in the world. And he now, with Red Alam, is recognized as the greatest painter of Negri too. So here we have an afro chino Huano who always recognizes his Chinese heritage, but whose greatest gift to Cuba is how he expresses afro cubanidad and Negri too. So that's my answer to some of you who ask, did these Asian immigrants leave uh, 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 their influence on Latin American national identity? And you have it early on in uh, La China Poblana, Mira Catarina de San Juan. No, you have her because she died at Lay Saint. And you have, you have it in with Reda Lam and many of the poets and artists that I very briefly introduced you to. One final thing that is truly, truly astounding, I think. I think all of you love Jamaican music, right? All of you, reggae, ska, all of that. But do you know that the Chinese Jamaicans had a huge, huge hand in creating and promoting and producing Jamaican music? Probably, probably wouldn't have happened. And I tell you why. Here is a little Chinese shop. When the Chinese went to Jamaica, oh, in the 1850s, 1860s, this time under the British, of course, slavery had been abolished. And the, and the freed and slave people spread out into the rural areas of Jamaica with a little plot of land. And they formed small rural communities. And that's where many of the Chinese went. And what did they do? They opened up what they call Chinese shop. That's what it's called the little local grocery shop that distributed foodstuffs and also bought the cacao that these, uh, that these uh, peasants were growing and distributing them to the world. You know? But what's interesting, if you look at these Chinese shops, here I have two, two slides of these Chinese shops. You notice that it's not only the shop, but there's always space in front of the shop and oftentimes space behind the shop. And these Chinese shop owners in these small, very poor towns of mostly peasants or cultivators, they were oftentimes the only people in town who had a radio. So they would string the radio on a tree outside the shop in the evenings, on the weekends, and they would have dance concerts and music concerts. See? And everybody gathered to sing and to dance and to create music. And from that, we now, we have Vincent and Pauline Chin, who became the greatest producers of Jamaican music. To this day, you know, they produce the records, they have the studios, they form bands, and I want to introduce you the final two slides to Jamaican Chinese bands who contributed to the production of this music. You know? Ho Sun Cheng, and his band called the Vagabonds, and Byron Lee called the Dragonaires. Okay. Finally, do you know that Naomi Campbell of Jamaica, Colin Powell, son of Jamaican immigrants, they both had Chinese grandparents. So I say you scratch a Jamaican, you buy the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, I've a lot on you. Try to respond to the questions in some way. Yes, please. Oh, fascinating. Everything you talked about, most of it I had never heard of before. Um, especially, uh, we were talking about Colin Powell in my social science class today. And I mean, my teacher mentioned he was Jamaican descent, but not that he had Chinese uh, ancestry. So that's super cool to know. Um, one major question that I have is, could you please talk a little bit more about the road, uh, 
Road and Belt Initiative from yes. China? Because I remember, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember reading maybe two or three weeks ago about the Chinese bid to purchase an El Salvadorian island. Yes. Is that correct? Or was that taken? Well, I won't be surprised. I don't know that detail, but they're buying a lot in Latin America and they're converting agriculture in Latin America to produce for Chinese needs. For example, Brazil has become the world's leading soya producer. Well, the Brazilians don't eat soybeans. How many Brazilians do you think go and buy tofu? <laughs> no. But, so they, it, it's just like, why do Latin Americans grow coca? Because there's a market for it, right? There's a big market for soya in China and maybe in other parts of Asia. So if you go to Brazil, you go to Bolivia, you go to South America, they've converted a lot of their land to soya production. So if they're buying an island in El Salvador, that's because they, this, they have a, a, a purpose in mind, no? Yeah. But the Belt and Road Initiative basically is a Chinese soft power, right? Mm -hmm. Conquering the world. I call it the Chinese empire. Through Some people don't like it, but I, I'm gonna call it anyway, because it gets your attention, right? <laughs> so, so, so does your uh, use of American empire, most people, Oh no, that is truly yeah, that, an is, empire. that is true. Yeah, that, that is a fault of American system. education or right. American history. Right. When we deny that we had a what do you call when we go to Mexico and beat up a, <laughs> a Mexico and take away half its national territory? That's empire. Yeah. What yeah. do you call the Louisiana per I mean everything? And yeah. not to mention the Native Americans whose land we exactly. just took. Exactly, but under the guise of manifest destiny. Yeah, you know, for they, manifest destiny they is a whole new word for empire. Yeah. You next time you're in a class where manifest destiny is mentioned, <laughs> you need to get up and speak up. <laughs> I shall. So, really, you I teach shall. the professor, why don't you call this American empire? I shall. Yeah. Yeah. No, really. <laughs> Some of us, right, and you know, and others are professors, Kathy. And, yeah. yeah, we have to begin. Just so I give you another example. I talked about the Japanese. I didn't even mention what happened to the Japanese in California and the West. They were put in concentration camps. Mm -hmm. Note that I use the word concentration camps. I don't use relocation camps or even internment camps. These were concentration camps. Now, they're not the same as what the Jews were put in by the Nazis. Those should be called death camps. You see how we euphemize everything? No. We put euphemism something. So, yes, it's an empire. We, USA, America, definitely have it. Absolutely. What do you think going to Hawaii was all about? What, what do you think going to Manila was all about? Do you know after the Spaniards left Manila, the Philippines? The US came in. The US came in right away. No, four, four Philippines, the two years of autonomy or freedom, and then the US came in. So what do we call that? What do we call that? You know, crossing the entire Pacific to take the Philippines. That's empire. See? Very good. Don't be afraid to challenge your professors. Oh, no, usually I'm not. No. That's the only way we're going to get good if our students stand up to us. Maria is in high school. She's a high school student. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. I'm a senior, so yeah. I'm right on the cusp. Good for you. Thank you. And, and maybe, uh, Professor Hart, you can share a little bit about how you got to this path of becoming a professor yeah. and got um, interested in this topic. Well, I came as a refugee to America. My family came as refugees. We came during a time when the Chinese exclusion was still in effect that nobody was allowing us to come to this country. But my parents had left China in 49, went to Hong Kong where we were stranded for 10 years and the British gave us no status. So for the first 10, 12 years of my life, I was a refugee. I was born in wartime China, didn't even have a birth certificate. No. Here I am, I have no birth certificate. I can't prove that I exist. But during the Cold War, the Cold War, a group of cold warriors in the US Senate said, we got to do something and save those Chinese from communism. Look at they're fleeing communism and nobody will take them in. So they created a lottery system and my parents went and picked out a good number. And so we came to America at the you know, very beginning of the Cold War and we 
my parents said, we're going to settle in California. Okay, our Chinese know about California. <laughs> but we're going to settle in a town called Palo Alto because there's a great university there. Now, in high school in Palo Alto, my classmates were named Hewlett's and Packers. And we all went to Stanford University. Oh, my parents gave me plan A, go to Stanford on a scholarship. They didn't have a plan B. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of confidence in the American system, right? So I went to Stanford and this is what happened. Stanford opened my eyes up to a part of the world that I never knew existed. They selected a group of us to go to Brazil. And I thought, going to Brazil sounds like much more fun than working a job in the summer flipping burgers. So I applied and I got admitted. But I went to Brazil at the time of liberation theology, the great opening of the Catholic Church. And it was also the time of Paulo Freire. For those of you who know about Paulo Freire and the pedagogy of the oppressed, yeah. right? And you may also know about Francisco Julian who organized the Ligas Campesinas, the peasant leagues. This was a really perfect era, era of Brazil, just before the military took over, by the way. So me, 18 years old, sophomore, I stand for what do I know? I got the name Dom Helder Camara, who is the Archbishop of Recife. I was brash. I was young. No, I had bad manners, but I wasn't afraid, and I knocked on his door. And he opened the door, invited me for dinner, and the next thing I knew, I was living with his secretary. He told his secretary, take this Chinese American girl to your home. She needs some place to sleep. So the secretary took me home. Now we're in Northeast Brazil, they see things. I said, wow, how can I impose on this family, right? Suddenly, you know, but guess what? She said, don't worry, it's very easy for us to welcome a guest. Because in that part of Brazil, they all slept on hammocks. And they had the big sleeping porch. They said, we'll just string an extra hammock. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I was for a good part of the summer. And I became politicized and radicalized. And I learned about Latin America. But most of all, as I traveled through Latin America, this is why I said Latin America is a land of diversity. No, of course you're going to see, particularly in a place like Brazil, the Afro descendants, the people of African descent. No, Brazil has, of course, brought in many, many slaves, millions. But I also saw Asians everywhere, Chinese and Japanese. Talk about textbooks. I say, how come my textbooks, my history books, never talk about this? No. There's got to be some story there, so I put it in the back of my mind. Then I went, finished my education at, at Stanford, and I decided to become a Latin Americanist. Why did I decide to become a Latin Americanist? Here's the Cold War coming to my rescue again. Oh, we're still in the middle of the Cold War. You know, my campus was torn up, anti-war, women's movement, everything was going on. But Latin America was really important to us. No, because Latin America was fighting its own wars of national liberation. The U.S. Department got very concerned after Castro's revolution in Cuba and then all of Central America, you know, rising up against the oligarchy, against imperialism, want to decolonize, all these things. And the U.S., not the State Department, the Defense Department put a lot of money in to produce very quickly experts in the third world. At that time, Cold War, we had a construction called the third world. The third world is supposedly on the line, right? It's not the first world yet, which is the US. It's not the second world, which is the communist world. It's the third world, which everybody was fighting over. See? Oh, the first, the market. The uh, capitalist world, the communist world, they're all fighting for the hearts and souls and minds of the third world. And I got a big fat fellowship, all <laughs> expenses paid by the US Defense Department to get my PhD in Latin American studies. I, everything was paid for. Well, guess
guess what? I didn't even have to TA. I mean, <laughs> you know, those of you who have who, who go to graduate school as a TA, it's not really a full scholarship, you know. They make you work. You're working. <laughs> I didn't work. I never <laughs> TA. I finished my PhD in two years. It's got to be record time. But I didn't have to TA. I didn't have to do a thing. But I decided at the time that I wasn't going to do anything on the Chinese and Latin America because everybody's going to typecast me. Already I had to go through that. So guess what? I wrote my dissertation and wrote three books, one in Spanish, on the Yaqui Indians of the U.S. Mexican border. And it's still in print. Second edition of my book was just published by the University of Wisconsin. Look under my name. It's got to be in your library. So that's my story. But, but here's another thing. So I was researching the, the U.S. Mexican border where the Yaqui Indians were there fighting Mexican, fighting U.S. investors, all, all of those things that I spoke about very briefly. I mean, into Chinese there. They kept, there were mentions of Chinese scattered all over the documents. And I said, that's a story. Remember, I saw the Japanese and the Chinese in Brazil. Then I ran into them again in Mexico. And that's when I realized the Chinese are everywhere. Then I went to Cuba and I thought, oh, the Chinese are all over Cuba. And, and actually, this has become a really big field of research, the Chinese in Latin America, right? Lots of people are doing it now. I have two graduate students working with me right now you know, on the Chinese and Latin America. And more want to come, but I said I can't take on any more. You know? So it's a big deal. And more and more books are coming out. And it's really fantastic. And it speaks to what I had alluded to earlier, the racial mixture of Latin America. That is what is one of the reasons why people are so attracted. And if you, in case you haven't figured out, the reason why racial mixture is so important in Latin America, particularly with the Chinese, is because until recently, most of the immigrants were men. They're men, you know? They're like everybody else. They want companionship, they want families, they want love, they want intimacy. Local women. See, so in Mexico, the local women were mostly the mestizo, no, local Mexicano women. In Cuba, they were the Afro-Cubano. Uh, in the Caribbean, it's not hard to figure out. It's not hard to figure out. I think we have time for one more question. If anyone would like to ask Professor Bjorn. Yeah. Do you have any books specifically on um, Afro-Asian Latinos? Well, uh, I mentioned, I, 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 mm, yes, yes. I recommend that you read Lisa Yun, Y U N. Okay, Lisa Yun, it's not exactly about Afro Asian Latinos, but Lisa Yun has a very interesting thesis that I am not entirely bought into, but basically what she says, because of the history of Chinese contract laborers you know, coming at a time when slavery was still going strong. She basically says you cannot read um, Chinese Cuban history without going through Afro Chinese, I mean, uh, Chinese, uh, African Chinese history, right? She sees the two are so connected that you cannot see Chinese history in Cuba without looking at it through the prism of African history in Cuba. Now, I, I, I'm not entirely persuaded by that, but I think you should read the book. I, uh, I, I, one of the things that uh, I haven't had time to go into are two things that we very quickly mentioned it. One is the question of self-orientalizing. You know, these, these Asian uh, creative artists, poets and writers, no? Uh, and uh, there's, a, there, there's evidence of what we call self-orientalizing. You know what self-orientalizing means? What's orientalizing? When we say orientalizing, what is that? Adopting customs and habits from 
from the region historically oh, yeah, referred to yeah. as Oriental. But when we say we're orientalizing a subject, it's it. Easternizing. Uh, Easternizing. Okay. Oh, Easternizing. 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 Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a certain kind of stereotyping, no? Right? That oh. you're stereotyping something, you're orientalizing something based on not necessarily knowing exactly what the person or the individual or the group is about, but imposing a set of three uh, assumptions about that. Self-orientalizing is doing it to yourself, exotifying yourself, making yourself you know, oriental. And oriental itself is a word that is problematic. See? Oriental. You know? It's the way the West looks at the East. The West looks at the East as, as oriental. You know? The very word itself. All right, that's one thing. The other thing that I ask about Afro- uh, Chinese Caribbeans okay, is whether the law of hypo descent applies. What is the law of hypo descent? Anthropologists know that, but we commonly call it the one drop rule. That is, those of mixed Asian and African descent peoples, does the African heritage predominate so that they almost, the other part, the other heritage almost doesn't have the option of expressing itself or prioritizing that. Colin Powell, some of you say that's an example. Oh, no, you know, over two generations, the, the, the Asian heritage is kind of left out and we only look at the African heritage. That's the law of hypothesis. Does that play out in, in Latin America and the Caribbean? In other words? But that's a that's a very good question. So I just suggest one book missing you, but there there are other books. If you look in the library or Google, I bet you'll find other books of yours. It's becoming again a pretty a pretty uh, uh, attractive topic for yeah. you know there are Afro Chinese in the United States as well, Afro Japanese, but we don't talk very much about that. Uh, where's the biggest concentration of now within the U.S.? In the U.S., mm, where do you think? Uh, California, probably. Huh? California, probably. That's like southern. California, that's south. Very good. She's there. In the south, closer to the southern part. Oh. But 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 they were not necessarily. Uh, see, this is what I mean by south by race conscious. Latin America readily acknowledge the fact that we have race mixtures. They are so conscious of it that they actually created up to 16 categories, you know, right? The CASTA category, C-A-S-T-A. -S you really ought to look it up. Each, each different combination of racial mixture is assigned a label. You know, if you have one quarter white, one quarter like the, uh, 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 native, uh, indigenous, and one quarter something else, black, you you have a name. And these are racial classifications. In the US, because of the one drop rule, because of apartheid, because of Jim Crow and all that, we don't acknowledge anything in between. That's what the one drop rule means. It means you're either white or black. There's nothing in between white or black. But you can. If you have rules. If you set out rules that says only white people can have access to this and black people cannot do this, you can't have anything in between because that screws up the system. So, but in Latin America, they don't have these kinds of strict racial rules. Yes. Uh, so I was going with the question about the national like place of origin and such. And so you already touched on that. Yeah. So I just wanted to thank you for coming today and speaking. Your work is really important. This is a topic that really needs more highlighting and work in it. So thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah, we got.
really great. We have hope for the future. We are so so a sophomore in high school. You too. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, well, it's, it's thanks to programs like these that are open yeah. to high school students. Like really? Yeah. Not in your high school? Nope. nope. They come for class on Thursdays. <laughs> Wonderful. Great. Great. Please take more food on your way out. We should be over there. Outside. Oh, I'm I'm good. 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 oh yes, I'm coming. I mean, uh, next to you. That's right. 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 That's